everyone. In just a moment, I'm going to be introducing author Lucy Tan, and we're going to be talking about her brand new debut novel called What We Were Promised. It's out this week. The link will be below. You can go there and get it. And I am so happy for her because I've read such good things about this book already, and it's just coming out. And I loved it so much. I learned so much about Shanghai. I can't wait to ask her questions about it. And everyone, here is Lucy. Hi, everybody. I am so excited because I'm speaking with Lucy Tan, and we are going to be talking about her brand new book called What We Were Promised. It comes out this week, debut novel. I am so excited for you. I couldn't believe this was your debut novel. I didn't look up anything. I just read them, okay? And then I saw, I was like, what? This is her. Somebody said something about, oh, debut novelist. I was like, are you are you kidding me right now? I had no idea. And that is a huge compliment. <laughs> so much. I really appreciate that. Oh, I learned so much. I love, first of all, I love family books, you know, when it's, I don't know, like family drama, I should say. They kind of put it under like domestic, I guess, in Amazon. And this story was so good. I learned so much about the Chinese culture that, you know, that that we don't learn about <laughs> too much here. And I think everyone is just going to just fall in love with these characters. And I love how you wove in their history. And uh, it was amazing. You did an amazing job. So that you feel that way. I mean, I really did want, you know, this book to be not an introduction, but a window into the way that modern Shanghai, or at least um, one, at one particular place in modern Shanghai, the way that it works in the communities that are there. Yeah, and I think we're always interested in that culture because it's so different for us. I have a lot of friends that are Chinese and I'm always, I always feel like I'm drilling them like, no, what's it like? What's it? Okay. What do you do here? You know, like, cause it is so different. And what I loved is that these characters start there, you know, grow up in Shanghai, move here for 10. So like, <laughs> That's your experience. That's a lot of Chinese people's experiences that they then live here, adopt this, adopt this culture, go back. Right. Now. I, I mean, that's just, you know, it, it's just the way of the world, but it's crazy. It was so good. I, th that actually, um, that set of Chinese, you know, locals who then move abroad for education in the States and come back are a, a group of like a community, I, I guess you could call them, called Haigui, and it's um, Chinese for sea turtles. So sea turtles kind of, um, they return to their roots oh, after yeah. spending, you know, a lifetime abroad. And so my parents fall into this category of um, Chinese who moved overseas for graduate school and then found jobs and had lives and then have come back to China to sort of, um, for a homecoming, I suppose, like and a totally so, different China, a totally yeah. different China than what they live in. China. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know, I have a lot of, my, my Chinese friends are from Beijing. Okay? okay. So I don't know a lot about Shanghai, but so I went and looked at it on the map and I was like shocked because I was thinking it was way more South than what I was <laughs> imagining because you talk about it being hot. So I guess I always think South, but I didn't look to see where the equator is, but is it warm all year? Is that the... No, um, it's not warm all year round, but... For some reason, it is it is just really. I think particularly the scenes in the expo, it just takes place in the heat of summer. There are just so many people. You know, it's a, a huge expanse, sort of cleared away for this one um, event, and so the, there there aren't those you know tall buildings to sort of give shade, and it's just a lot of people. And um, so I think that's also what's attributing to or contributing to the, to the heat. Yes. But, um, I also think that, you know, Shanghai in itself is a huge metropolis. It has so many skyscrapers and yet it's not as dense as let's say New York city because it's just a bigger city. Yeah. yeah. There's yeah. more space. Well, I actually looked up a lot of pictures because I wanted to see, because the, the World Expo is so big in this story, and I wanted to see like the what it looked like, and and the way that the river ran between the two sides, like I saw the picture, I was like, oh my God, that's so beautiful. It really is beautiful. Yeah, I mean, there is this, um, if you ever get a chance to go to Shanghai, there is, I think it's called the Urban Planning Center, and it lays out um, what the government has decided 
this city should look like. And so in a way, it's really cool because it's got this very futuristic look, but then it also feels a little bit planned out. So people, some people don't necessarily like that. Um, they prefer cities that look a little bit more organically grown, like let's say New York city, I suppose. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's wonderful there. Yeah. So this story really is kind of like you kind of lived this story, like through your parents and family and, you know, but you know, it's, the characters are so good. So did you take some of your family members? Did you use them to develop these characters? At the very beginning, maybe in, so my characters, their backgrounds are similar to my parents' backgrounds in that they were born in China, had been in the States and, and came back. Uh, my uncle was involved for a time in gang, so that that's true. But <laughs> beyond those very basic facts and experiences, they're not my family at all. Um, my and my my grandparents um, lived through the Japanese occupation and the Cultural Revolution, as did my parents. And so I took a lot of the information that I sort of gathered from them and used it in the novel as well. I love, I'm going to read this because I have it on my phone and I just have my camera, but I want to read the beginning of this because this is at the end of the prologue and I just love the way you worded this. So I want to tell, I want to read it for everybody. In China, a person's day might start with the sun a little higher or a little lower than that of his countrymen, but their lives were all marked by the same clock. No matter how far apart they lived, America had six time zones. Lena's father called it the land of dreams, and so it seemed, for what other country would aspire to occupy the past, present, and future all at the same time. When I read that, I was like, oh my God, that's brilliant. <laughs> so good. And and it's like that's the prologue and that's them leaving Shanghai, Lena and and Wei. I want to say Wei. Right. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and and it was just like, ah, oh, you got me right there for this story, right at that paragraph. So Yeah, I mean I think it's I I wanted to start there and sort of talk about what America meant to um these immigrants in the very beginning, because what America means to them at the at, you know, in the next part of the book is very different. Um, so I think of my characters as people who initially start out seeking this American dream that, you know, we hear about a lot in immigrant stories, but then, you know, after that prologue, they become these immigrants who are, um, who have achieved that kind of success and now they're bringing it home to China and see, and, and, and the re-envisioning of this American dream or, you know, what becomes a goal for them is, to figure out how they can sort of use their success and reinvest it back into this country. And then the question is, you know, what is China capable of now? Um, and how is China going to perhaps even supersede the U S and, you know, whatever ways. Yeah. I mean, Lena's story, I loved it so much because, and it's just interesting because I'm in my fifties. I have adult children. I have six children. I have adult children. And, um, my friends and I are always talking about like that transition from childhood to adult of like our relationship. Okay. And so when you were right, you know, when I was reading about Lena's story and how dedicated to her parents, she is, it's such a different culture. Like our children grow up and hopefully they'll call us and <laughs> you know, like, I don't know. It's such a different experience than, yeah. you know, than what she was saying, you know, like she, Oh, she felt like she owed them. You know, right, they, they right. arranged a marriage, her dad arranged a marriage, and she was like, that's the least I can do. And I was like, yeah, my children would be like, yeah, okay, bye. <laughs> you know, I like that a lot, um, which is, I guess it's a little surprising, it shouldn't be surprising to me, I forget that the, the cultures are so different, but it's true, I think America is so much more focused on the individual. You know, when you're in school, right. uh, parents and teachers are saying, you know, be proud to be different. And um, you can be anything that you want when you grow up. And from a very young age, kids are given independence. They do chores and they earn allowances and, you know, they take on their own student loans. And it's they're sort of trained from an early age to be an independent working adult. And as, you know, consequently, I don't know about consequently, but part of that is that the, the parents who raise them um, – don't end up living with them or they don't end up as sort of 
having their lives um, tethered to their children, as let's say in China, where from a very young age, it's all about this kind of family mentality. And so kids don't really, do, I mean, at least I would say my generation um, uh, and the generation before us, there, there's chores and things, but it's all for the good of the family. And you sort of know implicitly your your parents are going to give you everything and sort of fund your education and sort of give you the push um, for a better life as much as they possibly can. But in return, you know, you have to do whatever you can to um, listen to them and 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 um, be filial and you know obey their wishes and um, sort of make big life decisions as a family. Um, and so I think that with this generation of that way and Lena are in, where they grew up in China and they have those cultural values, but then they move to America and they're faced with a whole different set of cultural values. It's, you know, which do we belong to? And I think that um, the book is taking a place during a time in their lives when they're sort of trying to figure those questions out. Yeah, because their daughter, Karen... You know, it seems like, so she's kind of caught in between their American, you know, between being American and then being Chinese. And you can see the way she's parenting Karen is so much different than the way she was parented, you know, because she has some of those American ideals. Like here, it's like, we pay for their college, we pay for everything, but you can't ask for anything. <laughs> like, <it's not laughs> just leave. Then they say, bye, see you, we got a job across the country, see you later, you know, like, yeah. I don't know. There is a level of respect that I really admire, like to the parents. I mm-hmm. do. I just do. I think that it's really cool, like to have. I'm not saying that you have to be, you know, one extreme or the other, but I, you know, like there is a level of respecting what they say as yes. like that they're older and they know, and you kind of like go on that, right? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I agree with that. But I also think that there is. <laughs> Like, take Sunny's parents, for example, who are so adamant that she should, you know, find a mate and get married. And I guess this is kind of a spoiler, but they make decisions for her that are not good for her. Right. And it's right. because they don't see the world that she right. occupies. Right. Um, and they don't know what it's like to be a young person in 2010. So there's, there's that, too. Um, yeah. That's what I mean. There's like this balance, right? I mean, there's yeah. kind of. I just admired her. I admire admired Lena's respect, you know, mm-hmm. to her parents. And I was like, I, I'm not saying you should marry, <laughs> <laughs> but it was just an interesting because we've been talking. I've been talking about it a lot with my friends. So as I'm reading this, I was like, wow, this really is cool in a weird way. Like, you know, it's just such a different perspective, and I'm so glad that you brought that to light, you know, so that we can read it and get to learn that culture because it is so different, but there's something to learn about every culture. Yeah. So I, you know, I just love that part. But anyway, I also want to tell everybody and, you know, I'm not going to read the last line, but when you get to the last line, I love the ending of this book. And I, cause I love, I love beginnings and endings and, you know, quotes and you're the, last part I was like no I'm not gonna read it I don't do spoilers <laughs> and I was just afraid it might give a little bit more spoilers than I wanted to but and well I'm glad that it landed for you because that actually that last line was what I had written in the first draft and somehow didn't get changed wow so I'm always a little bit like is it right though because it, I you know it didn't go through any revision um, so I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that oh no I love the way it ended and you know you just I was as I was looking through all the reviews, I was like, she must be so happy. I mean, the reviews are just amazing. I I read that it's on top list. Pop Sugar listed as one of the top thirty books to read this summer. That's a huge list to get on for you know, yeah. it's out there everywhere. And I was like, as a debut novelist, like, are you just blown away by the reception? I'm really, really grateful. Um, <laughs> I didn't really know what to expect expect going into the process and the idea of you know there being some roundup lists and things were all it's just a very new um thing for me and so to see it um you know over and over again in these amazing publications um makes me feel really grateful for my publicist and the team working so hard at little brown and my agent yeah. rebecca um grading her but um yeah i i feel very very fortunate yeah. Okay. So I've been dying to know um, the the brother's name. How you say it in Chinese? Chang. I was saying King. 
I was using the Q as a tag. That's a really cool way of thinking about. So the thing about the names is I, so I enlisted my parents' help in, you know, creating these names. And um, my dad actually chose the ones for um, both Jen brothers. Okay. And um, Wei, Wei is great. And Chang means strength. And so I think both of those qualities really do um, speak volumes about the brothers' personalities. Well, my my really good friend, um, her name is Wang Ka in Chinese. And she's Wang. watching this, so hi, Ki. But she moved here, and she changed it to Ki Wang. But when uh, she, and she's in Beijing right now as we speak, but it's Wang Ka. And Ka supposedly means jade in Chinese. Oh. That's what she told me. So, okay. Okay. <laughs> but I, I think it's interesting because when you come here, you know, because we don't do that. And so you turn the name and key just stuck with her, that K E it's Americanized, but <laughs> you know, like, so I loved reading the names and trying to figure out the names. And that's why I was like, with the Q, I'm like, is that a hard Q? Like, <laughs> it's not even yeah. anything. It's nothing. like. <laughs> yeah. So how did you say it again? Ch- Cause I want to Chung. Okay. So it's like a C H. He's like a CH. Yeah, I just, I love that you put that in there. I mean, for the most part, you explain the names, even like um, little brother, big brother, you know, mm-hmm. little, I loved reading that because, you know, I love that culture and, and just seeing like how they switch the names around is very interesting to me. So yeah, I can see you did put a lot of work into it. Yeah, I mean, that is a part of the process that, I, I had to sort of figure out what I was going to do because the, the novel takes place, takes place the, the novel is told in two languages essentially, but I'm writing in one, but I also don't want it to seem, you know, to, to be totally void of Chinese. So I, I chose um, words and sometimes explained them, sometimes didn't, yeah. but I chose to do it in a way um, where it didn't affect the story if you didn't know what that Chinese, you know, phrase was. Um, and I had um, two friends read read the draft and one could read pinyin which is how it's spelled mm-hmm. in mandarin and the other couldn't and to sort of test the comprehension there and what they were getting out of the story yeah i love that i love that part of it i, I don't know it just brought the whole feel of the book alive you know so I, i'm really happy that you did that but uh so okay the big question before i let you go is what's next like this book is out there. You're doing tours and signings. I mean, I know that takes up a huge chunk, but I also know yeah. that since it's been out there, you've had to been writing since. Yes. So there's this like golden <laughs> few months after you sell your book and before, or after you turn in the final revisions and right. before the heavy work of promoting the book um, happens, where I started a new project. It's a novel and it's set in Wisconsin and it's about the lives of three young women who become actresses and their friendship and it's about ambition and art and that's as much as I know about it right now but it's really fun to write and um, hopefully knock on wood will become the next thing oh wow I I'll read it you you find me okay you know I'll read it I do I'll email you yeah th- I mean this was so much fun I want to show everybody this cover one more time because okay. the cover yeah, I love those colors. Oh my gosh! And there's that skyline right there, yeah. there, which is the skyline in 2010. Now it's different because the skyscrapers have just been popping up so quickly. And and um, so that bottom part is the river, I'm assuming. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's the river. Yeah. And what's the river's name? Huangpu. Go ahead. Huangpu. Okay, I had that kind of close. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's a beautiful color. I love those. I've seen it all over Instagram. You know, people are making pictures with it, with those colors, and it's just beautiful. So, yeah, it's incredible. Yeah, right. that's right. <laughs> so, everybody, we will be giving away a copy on Instagram, and this book is out this week. All the Amazon links are going to be there. Your website is going to be there. I loved your website. I went on it. It's it's beautiful. I love a good website. I love when authors have websites. And then you can just keep adding your books to it. It's awesome, yeah. you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Lucy. It was so, so nice to meet you. And I, I seriously, I can't wait for your next book. 
I really can't. This this book is was so amazing. I will be telling everybody about it. I appreciate that, Michelle. Okay, have a great day, Lucy. You Lucy. too. Bye bye. Bye. Everyone, thank you for watching that interview with Lucy. And we had, it's so crazy. She's in New York City. We are literally two hours away. And there was still a little bit of a delay going on. And so if we talked over each other, I, I tried to let like space <laughs> so that it, we weren't talking over each other so much. But it did seem to work out better than I thought it was going to. So I am so happy. Thank you so much, Lucy. This book is incredible. Debut novel. And, you know, I can, I didn't want to give away too much about it but I mean the Chinese culture she goes into it so much and if that interests you you are going to love this book so anyway thank you everyone for watching her links are listed below